Welcome back to Codex, everyone. Uh, today, we're very pleased to welcome Professor Tom Needham from Florida State University. Tom got his PhD from the University of Georgia in 2016 under Professor Jason Cantarella. And after a three-year stint at The Ohio State University in the Topology, Geometry, and Data Group, he began his current position at Florida State. Tom is an expert at applying topology and geometry tools to problems in data science. When he's not analyzing buckets of teeth or electoral maps, he's lent his expertise in symplectic geometry to solve problems in frame theory. And this is the subject of today's talk. Take it away, Tom. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Great to be here. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about uh, applications of symplectic geometry to frame theory. Um, this is all joint work with uh, Clayton Schonkweiler. <clears throat> Um, okay, so here, here's the general outline. Uh, I'll talk about frames. Um, so briefly, frames are collections of vectors um, in a complex vector space, we'll say C to the D. Um, always I'm gonna be talking about complex vector spaces. Uh, and we use these to give robust representations of signals um, by taking measurements uh, of this type. Uh, so the, the types of questions I'm, I'm interested uh, in uh, regarding frames are um, geometry and topology of certain subsets of frames, um, which have prescribed properties, such as prescribed vector norms or uh, certain spectral data, which I'll, I'll describe in detail um, during the talk. Uh, the kind of central theme uh, of the talk is that certain properties of these frame spaces um, can be seen through the lens of something called symplectic geometry. Uh, so, the, the, the goal of the talk here is to introduce the main ideas of symplectic geometry, um, to illustrate these ideas in, in a concrete setting uh, of frames, and then to use, um, to use these concepts to get new results about um, frame spaces. Okay, so um, I, I think that, that there's uh, plenty of experts in frame theory here, and I won't um, say too much about frame theory in general, um, but I'll, I'll at least set some notation. Uh, so to, to me, a frame is a spanning collection of n vectors in C uh, to the D, where I'm thinking of um, D as being less than n. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we pick an ordering of these vectors and stick them into a matrix. So I think of a frame as uh, a matrix in C to the D times n, um, where, where the columns are the frame vectors. And um, let's let uh, these brackets denote the standard permission inner product on uh, C to the D. <clears throat> All right, so a frame gives us um, several operators. So uh, the first such operator is called the analysis operator. Uh, this eats a frame and spits out, um, or sorry, eats a, eats a vector, which I think of as a signal, and spits out a bunch of measurements, which are dot products with my various frame vectors. Uh, and if I think about the frame as being represented by this matrix, that just is the operator that takes V to F star V. So I'll just, I'll say that F star is the analysis operator. Um, likewise, I can take a bunch of measurements, N of them, and uh, produce a signal by um, taking those measurements as coefficients for my frame vectors. Um, and then that is the, the synthesis operator is just the operator that takes W to F times W. And then um, finally, I get the frame operator by concatenating these two. So I take a signal, hit it with the analysis operator, hit it with the um, synthesis operator. Uh, so, so I'll refer to FF star itself as the frame operator. Um, and just one more piece of, of vocabulary here. So I'll say a frame is tight. If the frame operator, generally you say it's, it's some multiple of the identity, I'm going to pick a normalization um, just for convenience here and say it's that multiple of the identity. All right, and I'll let uh, script F to the DN denote the collection of all frames of that size, D by N. All right, so um, now, now let's talk about some geometry. So uh, there's some standard geometric structures on C to the D, which I can think of as R to the 2D if I like. Um, so if I use these coordinates specifically for uh, vectors in C to the D, then I get a standard inner product, which everyone's familiar with. Um, and I can think of that as the real part of the Hermitian inner product of the uh, two vectors. Uh, maybe less common is the standard symplectic structure, which um, you know, is a pretty natural thing. Uh, instead of taking the real part of the Hermitian inner product, I take the imaginary part. And uh, it's uh, customary to, to put a minus on in front. Um, 
Okay, so, so that looks like this in coordinates. And as an example, um, if D is one, I'm in R2 or the complex plane, then what is this? I take my two vectors here, um, make this computation, and, and that's uh, you know the scalar cross product, I guess. Um, so it's the signed area of the parallelogram that these guys span. So also a very natural um, geometric uh, structure. And then that leads um, directly into what is a symplectic structure. So I'll say uh, a, a fair amount of details about what symplectic geometry is. I'll, I'll assume that um, people are a bit less familiar with symplectic geometry. Um, so to start, I'll give a couple of definitions of what is a symplectic structure. All right, so let's let M be a smooth manifold. Um, the first definition is in terms of local coordinates. So a symplectic structure, uh, I'll denote it omega on M. Um, it's a thing that, you know, for each point in my manifold X, uh, I have a map which eats two tangent vectors at that point and spits out a real number. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's the assignment. And then uh, what makes it a symplectic structure? It's a symplectic structure if locally it just looks like the standard symplectic structure. All right. So um, implicitly, this means that M is a uh, two times D dimensional manifold. And so this means that symplectic manifolds are always, always even dimensional. Um, and what does it mean to say that these uh, are isomorphic locally? It means that if I you know, pick any point on my manifold, I can find a little open neighborhood, U, and some map to some open neighborhood in my um, R to the 2D, such that the pullback by that map of the standard symplectic structure is the one I'm dealing with on the manifold. And pullback here just means um, I take the derivative of phi, apply that to my tangent vectors, and then uh, stick that into the standard symplectic structure. And that, that should be the, the number I'm getting out from this thing. Um, okay, so, so that's one definition. And I, I think, um, you know, kind of natural. I'm just saying locally, uh, maybe globally has some topology to it, but locally it just looks like the standard symplectic space. Uh, I can do a, a coordinate-free definition of a symplectic structure um, in terms of a differential two-form. So here, a symplectic structure, uh, omega on M is a closed non-degenerate two-form. And what does that mean? Um, so it's still the same type of local assignment, OK? So at each point, I get a map from which these two tangent vectors spits out a number. Um, to make it a closed non-degenerate two-form, uh, the, the two-form part is saying that this is bilinear and skew-symmetric. So bilinear means bilinear. Uh, skew symmetric means that if I plug in the same vector twice, I always get zero. Um, Non-degenerate means that uh, you know if omega applied to u v is zero for all v, then u must have been zero. Okay, and then um, the the more mysterious thing maybe is the closed condition. So this says that the exterior derivative of my two form is zero. So this is some sort of differential operation which. Um, takes a two-form and produces a, uh, a three-form, which, which eats three vectors. Um, so I'm saying that this is identically zero, and that's, uh, by definition, means that it's a closed two-form. Okay, so, so that's two different definitions of a symplectic manifold, and um, then the, the theorem, that kind of the, the fundamental theorem of symplectic geometry is Darboux's theorem, which says that these are the same definition, in fact. Um, so I can, I can make this coordinate-free definition, and in fact, if I have something which satisfies this coordinate-free definition, I can always find these local coordinates that um, kind of standardize my manifold locally. Uh, so, so this is like, if you compare this to Ramani geometry, this is kind of a surprising thing, actually. So if I take a two-sphere, for example, um, any neighborhood of, of, say, the North Pole, there's no way to flatten it out, right, so that uh, the, the pullback of the... Um, the, the standard inner product in R2 is equal to the, the round metric on the sphere, right? So uh, Ramani manifolds have local invariance and there's some kind of like um, rigid geometry going on there. So Darboux's theorem is saying that symplectic manifolds are much less rigid. They only have kind of global invariance. Locally, they all look the same. The only invariant, I guess, being um, dimension. All right. so. Uh, let me give a little bit more intuition for what a symplectic structure is. So, so here's, I mentioned the abstract, I think that um, symplectic structures really come from physics. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not a physicist. So, uh, you know, 
take bear that in mind as I explain this, but um, I, I think that the, the physical interpretation does give some intuition for where these conditions come from. Okay, so um, here's the definition again, I'm thinking of this in the, the coordinate free version. So omega is a closed non-degenerate two form on my manifold. Uh, the, where this comes from in physics is I'm supposed to think of my manifold as the phase space of a physical system. And the main example of this would be that um, M is like the cotangent bundle of some other manifold, okay? So here I have, uh, say a circle as my manifold N, the cotangent bundle attaches a vector space um, to each point of my manifold. So then, uh, and, and the vector space is the same dimension as the manifold itself. So that um, means that the, the cotangent bundle is twice the dimension of the base manifold. So this means that M is always even dimensional. And you're supposed to think of uh, the first coordinate here, which would be a point of the manifold as like a position of a particle or something. Um, and P is like a, a momentum. Uh, so, so that's why this is thought of as a phase space. All right, so then uh, now I, I pick some energy function. So this is just a function from M, say from this cotangent bundle to R, and this is supposed to represent like the total energy of a phase. Uh, then all of the conditions in the definition of a symplectic form have some physical meaning. Um, so, so omega Sorry, being, but, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the notation for cotangent bundle is suggests with the star, it suggests there's like a dual object going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Be thinking about this. That's right, right. So I can take the tangent space. Um, so like the cotangent space is dual to the tangent space? Precisely, yeah. So, okay. so if I take the dual of that tangent space, that's the, the cotangent space, precisely. Right, so um, yeah, so, so all of these conditions in, a, in the definition of asymplectic form mean something physically. Uh, so, so it being a bilinear form means that I'm able to take my energy function and produce a vector field just by, uh, you know, according to this equation, right? So I take the, the, the derivative of my energy function applied to some vector V. I want my mystery vector field um, to, to make this equation hold, right? So I can plug V into the second spot and my uh, mystery vector field in the first spot. So that, that's just a, an equation I could set up for any old bilinear form. Um, the point uh, of non-degeneracy is that I can actually solve this and I can actually produce a vector field. Um, so then the, the thing you're supposed to take away here is that in this physical uh, setup, what does the symplectic form do? It eats an energy function and spits out like the, the dyna dynamics of the phase space. Um, that omega is skew symmetric, remember, means that when I plug the same vector in twice, I get zero. But uh, if I use this equation, that tells me the derivative of my energy function along this vector field, which is called the Hamiltonian vector field. Um, so this is telling me that the derivative of my energy function in the evolution direction is zero, which is telling me that um, the dynamics of the phase space evolve with constant energy. Uh, and then finally, the, the kind of more mysterious condition that omega is closed. Um, so, so I won't maybe explain the full details of this computation, but the idea is that there's something called uh, a Lie derivative. And this is a way to um, kind of see how the, uh, the form changes as I move along a vector field. So I, I move a little bit in the Hamiltonian vector field direction. Basically, I'm seeing how the uh, form changes. Um, this equality is uh, Carton's identity. Um, so it, it takes a lead derivative and it allows you to express it in terms of uh, exterior derivatives. And then the point is, um, assuming that omega is closed, means that uh, d omega is zero and d squared always gives me zero is another property of exterior derivatives. So overall my lead derivative is zero. Um, and that, that's really coming from this assumption that omega is closed. So what is this saying? It's saying that uh, if I take my phase space and I evolve according to my energy function, that my laws of physics, which is encoded in the symplectic structure don't change. So you can think of uh, omega being closed as saying that um, physics are like time invariant. Okay, so let's look at some examples of, uh, of symplectic manifolds. So this is the standard symplectic manifold, um, CD with negative imaginary Hermitian inner product. Uh, frame space is also naturally a symplectic manifold because I can take the space of all frames. That's an open subset of C to the D times N, 
um, which is isomorphic to, to uh, c to the d times n, right? Um, just a, a standard complex vector space. Um, here, I mean standard permission pro inner product. Here, I mean Forbini center product. But this isomorphism is just like reshape things, right? So I can think of frame space just as like an open submanifold of uh, my standard symplectic manifold. And just to give um, maybe a compact example, so the, the, the two sphere um, with omega equal to signed area is also a symplectic manifold. So what does that mean? I take my two sphere, I take a couple tangent vectors. Um, so I'm supposed to get signed area, which I can, I can write out on the two sphere uh, as take u cross v dotted with x, where x is my base point, And it turns out that this is also a um, symplectic structure. Uh, let's see, here, here's an example of thinking about the Hamiltonian flow and what that really looks like. So here, my energy function is just height on the sphere. Um, the, the vector field you're maybe used to producing out, out of a, a function would be the, the gradient. So the gradient um, increases my energy. It's pointing up. The, the Hamiltonian vector field is horizontal. So I take my gradient and I'm twisting it. Um, so you notice that uh, as I flow along this, I'm flowing along constant height um, circles, right? So, so that's saying that uh, the, the flow in my phase space preserves energy. Okay. And then here, here's like the computation that gets you this. <clears throat> okay, so I think I also mentioned my abstract that um, kind of a thing that symplectic geometry is good at is studying group actions on manifolds and symplectic manifolds in particular. Um, so he, here's how to make that precise. So let's suppose that M uh, is a symplectic manifold and I have an action by a Lie group G. Um, okay, so the first thing to define is the infinitesimal uh, action um, <clears throat> of the, the Lie algebra. Okay, so if I take some uh, a vector in my Lie algebra, I can produce a vector field in my manifold, which I'll denote like this. And this just says, um, well, scale the vector by t, exit out. So then I get an element of my Lie group, and then I can act on a point on my manifold. And then I take the derivative uh, at zero, and I get a vector field. Okay, so in this picture, I have my um, symplectic manifold S2. I spin it around the z-axis by an S1 action, and the corresponding um, infinitesimal action is this rotational vector field. Okay, so I haven't said anything about how that interacts with the symplectic uh, structure yet. So the, the action is called Hamiltonian if it admits something called a momentum map. Uh, so that's a couple of conditions. I want um, u to be equivariant with respect to the co-adjoint action, meaning um, on the left, I can act on a point by an element of the group. On the right, I can act on an element of the dual of the Lie algebra by the adjoint or the co-adjoint action of that group element. Um, so, so this is the dual to the adjoint action. And, and if you're in like a matrix Lie algebra, that's just conjugation. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so, so that's one condition. I need this equivariance property. And then the other condition is this. So what's going on here? Um, <clears throat> let's see. So V is an element of the tangent space to M at X. Okay, so I can stick that into the derivative of mu. And that should produce something uh, that lives where, I guess, then this whole thing would live in the tangent space to uh, at mu x of g star, which I'm going to identify with g star because it's a vector space. So then I can plug something in from g, that's my c there, and I get a number, okay? That's the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I could also get a number by um, taking the infinitesimal action of that Lie group or that Lie algebra vector, that's here, you know, evaluated at x, and then take the symplectic form evaluated on that infinitesimal action um, and this tangent vector v. Okay, so uh, that's the definition of um, the momentum map, or the, the, that's the, the condition that's necessary for the momentum map. And then, like I said, the, the group action is Hamiltonian if I have one of these. Okay, so let's look at an example of this. Um, <clears throat> Just a sec, Soledad has a question for you. Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't see the okay. chat, go ahead. 
Uh, she asks, is there a relationship with conservation of energy? Yeah, uh, right. Um, well, th there are lots of relationships with conservation of energy. So you can see, um, I mean, I guess, first of all, like the kind of interpretation you're supposed to have for the momentum map is that um, this should tell you conserve quantities of the group action, basically. So this is saying, given a point, I want a way to um, eat like uh, a little infinitesimal action in my group and spit out a number. And that rule is supposed to be like the conserved quantity of the group action. Um, and you can also see that this interacts with the Hamiltonian vector fields. So uh, you see that um, in this example, so maybe let's, let's go through this example and see if that uh, kind of illuminates what's going on there. So if I look at this, uh, if I look at the sphere, once again, this is my, my favorite example to draw um, with this circle action. Uh, then, okay, I'm going to identify the dual of Lie algebra with R. And then um, the claim is that this, the momentum map here is just height along the z-axis, which um, indeed, if that's my momentum map, then uh, the conserved quantity of this rotation would indeed be height. So that this at least um, intuitively aligns with what I was saying before. Um, now, you also notice that uh, that um, the, the mu here is like a Hamiltonian like energy function. And then the, the corresponding uh, rotational vector field would be like the Hamiltonian vector field. Um, and and that's, that's not really a coincidence either. So th these are all tied together in that way. Um, and that, then what's the, here, here these computations are supposed to show you that like, okay, this is all like kind of abstract in generality, but you can just sit down and, and actually compute these things, um, at least in these uh, special circumstances. Um, so, so this is just verifying that, the derivative of the momentum map um, applied to a tangent vector and then applying that to an element of the Lie algebra gives me the same thing as evaluating the uh, splenic structure on the corresponding vectors. Um, okay, so now let, let's look at an example of a momentum map which is related to frames. Okay, so uh, I have my frame space, which remember is a symplectic manifold in kind of a boring way, it's an open um, submanifold of the standard symplectic manifold. And I have an action uh, by the Lie group UD, unitary group by left multiplication. Um, now I'm going to ident identify the dual of the Lie algebra uh, of UD with um, D by D Hermitian matrices. And the, the specific identification is given by this map. Okay then the claim is that the momentum map for this group action is actually the frame operator for the frame. Okay, so that, that's a, a Hermitian matrix I'm landing here. Um, <clears throat> and then once again, like there's a lot of moving parts in the definition of a momentum map, but uh, in the end, if you just sit down and, and kind of work out the computations, it, it, you can just do it, right? So, um, this is all using the specific isomorphism of D by D Hermitian matrices with the dual of the Lie algebra of UD. Uh, but, but once you choose that specific isomorphism, um, then everything kind of just falls out when you run through the computations. All right, so we've seen kind of uh, the, the first uh, non-trivial relationship between frame theory and um, and symplectic geometry that uh, a momentum map for a very natural action is a very natural frame theoretic quantity, the frame operator. All right, so uh, an important uh, piece of the story of how Lie groups act on symplectic manifolds is um, the idea of reduction of symmetry. And so, so the idea here is like, okay, I have a, a manifold and I have a group action. Uh, the thing you want to do is look at the quotient space, right? Take a uh, manifold mod group. But um, if you're in the symplectic category where you start with a symplectic manifold, you would like the quotient thing to be in the same category, like a, a symplectic quotient manifold. Um, but if the Lie group is, is uh, odd dimensional, then the dimensions don't even work out, right? When I look at the quotient space. Um, so it's not even necessarily even dimensional to when I look at the quotient space. So there's a, a more complicated uh, version of the quotient construction in the splitted category, and this is called um, Marsden-Weinstein reduction. All right, so how does this work? So uh, let's let M omega be a splitting manifold, and let's suppose that I have a Hamiltonian G action, okay, meaning it has a momentum map, 
uh, which eats a point in the manifold, spits out a point in the dual of the Lie algebra. Um, then the construction is this. So I don't just uh, take M and quotient out by G, I, I take a sub manifold of M and quotient out by G. And it's the zero level set of that momentum map. Um, okay, and so then the claim or the, the theorem, I guess, is that uh, this resulting quotient has a natural symplectic structure, um, provided like the thing you end up with is a manifold, which is what these uh, little caveats are saying here at the end. Um, and the symplectic structure you get, let, let's call it in, in this little diagram, uh, omega reduced, um, is uniquely characterized by this relationship, right? So I have this level set, which embeds into the manifold, uh, or on the other hand, projects down onto the quotient space. So I can look at the pullbacks of each of these um, symplectic forms, and they have to agree like at, at this intermediate space is the idea. All right, so, so the idea here is like this level set is a thing on which G still acts um, because of uh, equivariance of the momentum map. And then um, when I do this quotient operation, I'm kind of killing a degenerate part of the pullback of this metric or of this um, synthetic form. Okay, so let's let's do this in a, uh, in a frame setting. Um, so we had the space of frames, we had a unitary group action and we had a, a momentum map which was, um, remember, the frame operator. So then the, um, the claim is that the space of unitary orbits of tight frames is a symplectic manifold. And this is just applying this reduction theorem directly. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess with my momentum map a little bit and um, add a little constant here, which is OK. Um, it's like a differential condition, so I'm allowed to add a, a constant. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is so that I can look at a level set at 0, OK? So I define mu now to be um, frame operator minus the, the thing I, I want it to be equal to um, if it were a tight frame. And then I look at the space of tight frames with my chosen normalization. Uh, then that would be exactly the inverse image of this momentum map, um, or it would be the level set at zero of that momentum map. And then to um, carry out the, the, the reduction process, I, I've been quotient out by the group. So which is why I'm getting unitary orbits of tight frames. Okay, but then by the Mars and Weinstein reduction theorem, I mean, I guess you have to check stuff about regular values, free actions, but um, you're okay in this setting. Uh, you end up with a symplectic structure on this space, tight frames up to um, unitary equivalents. Um, okay, and a theme in, in what we've been doing actually is to take um, results that exist for spaces of tight frames and to generalize these to spaces of frames with different sorts of frame operators. Um, now, the issue is that uh, the, the original Mars and Weinstein theorem, as stated, was only about reduction at zero. And if I'm not at zero, um, I need to be a little bit more careful with how, uh, how I do the reduction. Um, <clears throat> okay, so here's a refined version of the Mars and Weinstein theorem. Uh, I don't have to reduce at zero. I can pick an arbitrary element of my um, dual of my Lie algebra, but I need, uh, I need the, the level set to be something which is gene variant. So in order to make that happen, I take a co-adjoint orbit of um, the point that I picked in the dual algebra. Okay, so I let uh, the co-adjoint um, action run over this thing and I, I get some orbit um, sitting in the, the dual Lie algebra and then I can look at the uh, level set of that full orbit, okay? Now, once again, that, that's something that um, of course embeds into the original symplectic manifold. I can quotient out by the group this is a, a thing on which G acts now. Um, so then I can, I can push down by the quotient map. Uh, and then once again, the resulting thing has a natural symplectic structure and, um, and it satisfies this uh, equality where kind of the pullbacks uh, agree at the intermediate space. All right, so now I can apply the same sort of reasoning um, as in a couple of slides ago and say that uh, more generally, if I take um, frames with prescribed frame operator spectrum, then the uh, space of unitary equivalence classes uh, of those frames is also a symplectic manifold using this refined theorem. Um, so once again, now, now I don't need to do this little translation trick. So I'm going to take my momentum map to be frame operator on the nose. And I'm just going to uh, now say, let, let's see. So, so I'm picking a spectrum of lambdas. And let's say that they're sorted 
Okay. Now I let uh, f d to the n sub lambda be frames such that the frame operator has that spectrum. Then that space is exactly the um, level set of the coadjuvant orbit of any d by d Hermitian matrix with that spectrum. Right. So, so since these are matrix groups, the coadjuvant orbit um, is really just conjugation. So I'm taking a frame operator, a target frame operator, conjugating it by unitaries. So I end up um, hitting everything with the same spectrum as that target frame operator. So then that's this coadjoint orbit. And then uh, when I look at the inverse image, I get all this stuff. All right, so um, yeah, so so far this has more or less been illustrating examples of symplectic stuff um, on frame theory type stuff. So now we can actually give an application uh, to frame theory and, and to get something, some new information about um, spaces of frames using, using this perspective. Uh, okay, so a let's make a definition. So a finite unit norm type frame or a fun TF is a frame which is um, both tight and uh, such that all of the frame vectors are unit norm. Okay, um, so, so there's uh, this conjecture by Larson uh, in 2002, uh, I guess back in an REU, uh, that the space of fun TFs is path connected. Uh, this was proved, I guess, 15 years later by um, Cahill, Nixon, and Strawn uh, in, in 2017 in, in their um, paper in Sayaga. Uh, and, and this paper, I'll say, was kind of uh, really the inspiration for looking at um, this frame theory stuff from a symplectic perspective. Uh, so th they gave a constructive proof um, using these little gadgets called eigensteps, which I'll talk about later. Um, their proof also applies to the space of real fun TFs, I'll, I'll mention, but um, I'm talking about always complex vector spaces here. Uh, so yeah, so, so re reading this paper, um, I realized, you know, that uh, this question about connectivity follows really from kind of um, basic symplectic principles. Uh, so you can give a, a non-constructive proof, which which doesn't apply to real frames, unfortunately, but uh, that's okay. Um, so, but but the proof follows easily. I put in scare quotes because that that you know depends on how much symplectic machinery you're willing to swallow and still say um, something's easy. Uh, and then, in fact, it also generalizes to other spaces of frames. So I can fix um, any vector of frame norms and any uh, frame operator I like, uh, say an invertible d by d Hermitian matrix. And I can look at the space of frames with those prescribed norms and with that prescribed frame operator, and uh, the uh, that space is path connected. So in particular, this shows that the space of complex fun TFs is path connected. Okay, so once again, it's going to be an argument that's based on group actions, um, as most things are in uh, this talk. So I have a new group action, and this is by um, a torus. So, like th this part's a little bit technical, but long story short, I, I have this torus which acts on frames by right multiplication. Okay, so this is just um, diagonal matrices with uh, you know unit magnitude complex um, numbers. On the diagonal, that x by right multiplication on the space of frames. There's some redundancy with this action, this right action of u1 to the n, and the left action of u to the d, which would be um, kind of constant uh, diagonal matrices. So that's why I'm modding out by this extra u1 here. Th this isn't really so important. So if that's annoying you, you can more or less ignore it. Um, the point is I'm taking u1 to the n, modding out by a certain u1 that's still a torus. I can identify it with diagonal things that have a one in the, in the last bottom entry, if I like. Um, and then that torus acts on this symplectic manifold, still by right multiplication, but then uh, up to equivalence class. Um, and it's a Hamiltonian action. And the momentum map is um, given by this, right? So I, I, I take a, a unitary equivalence class of a frame, and I'm supposed to spit out something in the dual of the Lie algebra to this torus which I'll identify with r to the n minus one. And what is it? It's, it's this vector of, of squared norms uh, up to a constant. Um, okay, I'll, I'll mention here that the image of this is a convex polytope um, and that you know, a, a, norm, a, a given norm vector lies in the image if and only if um, gamma is what's called lambda admissible, meaning that um, 
uh, assuming that gamma is sorted for simplicity, that, that I have these inequalities and this equality here. So this is uh, basically the existence of a frame with, with given um, vector of norms and given uh, frame operator spectrum. So this is um, due to Kosaza and Leon. Also, um, it's more or less like the Schoenhorn theorem. Uh, okay, so yeah, so that, then we'll throw like a, a big gun at this. Uh, so th there's a, a, a famous theorem of Atiya. This is really only part of, of the famous theorem, but um, this is good enough to get us where we need to be. Um, the theorem is that the level sets of uh, a Hamiltonian torus action are always connected. Okay, so here's an example, um, the one that we've been looking at. The height function is uh, a momentum map. And indeed, if I look at level sets of that momentum map, um, they're connected. Uh, on the other hand, um, I see that if I if I just took a torus, this is a symplectic manifold, um, and I can put the height function on it. Inverse images uh, or level sets are not connected, so that tells me that this is actually not a momentum map. Here. Okay, so we're, we're thinking about this picture. All right, so then um, now we can prove the theorem, and, and once again, it follows. Um, you know, easily from some Plutic principles, if you're willing to, you know, believe the the, the Atiyah's theorem, right? So you say, uh, all right, pick a vector of norms, pick a spectrum. I look at um, the space of frames with the given uh, frame norms and such that the frame operator has the given spectrum. Um, and then I know that uh, if I look at the inverse image of a certain thing, uh, in, in the dual of the Lie algebra to the torus. So here I'm just saying, take the vector of norms, square um, element wise, take minus one half, um, just because the momentum map looks like this, right? <clears throat> uh, look at the inverse image, that would be exactly the space that I'm after uh, up to unitary equivalence. Um, and this is connected by a T is theorem. Okay, so we, we just throw that um, big theorem at it. And then th this isn't this isn't quite the thing that we're after, but then um, deriving the, the result that we really want is just kind of a few simple topological arguments. Okay, um, so let's look at uh, another application. So this is uh, singularities of frame spaces. Um, so say a frame is orthodecomposable, if I can partition its vectors into frames which span orthogonal subspaces, so everything's complex, but this is kind of like the mental picture I have. So I, I have a frame and I can kind of like say that a few of them span this subspace, another one spans an orthogonal subspace, this thing's orthodecomposable. Um, so there's a theorem of Dykeman and Strawn that says that the space of Funchy Fs um, is not necessarily a manifold. Um, it's at least a stratified space, but you know that the singularities only occur at orthodecomposable frames. Okay, so, so these are like the bad points um, from the perspective of is my space a manifold or not? So in particular, um, if D and N are relatively prime, then that uh, you don't have any orthodecomposable things, and then fun DF space is a smooth manifold. Um, so once again, we, we play the same game where we can take a, a result about fun TFs and uh, kind of reprove it using some plastic geometry, but then also it's a general principle, so it will go through to other sorts of frame spaces. Um, so if I pick any vector of norms and uh, spectrum lambda, um, this space of frames with prescribed frame operator spectrum and prescribed norms of the frame vectors uh, <clears throat> is also not necessarily manifold. Uh, contains, uh, but the, but the singularities occur also at orthodecomposable frames only. Um, this next block, you know, is a little bit technical, but more or less, it's like the generalization of this condition. Okay. So th there are conditions that you can put on your gamma and your lambda that say, well, I'm not able to like kind of chunk stuff up and get orthodecomposable frames. And then in that case, this space is a smooth manifold. Um, I'll say a little bit here. So this, is, this part's more work in progress, but um, I think this can be sharpened and you can use um, results of ARMS, Marsden and Moncrief, uh, which tell you actually when you're sitting at level sets of momentum maps, um, you can say exactly what they look like uh, up to diffeomorphism. So I think that we should be able to classify exactly what the singularities look like in frame space. Um, so we know, we know, you know, in particular that uh, they look like quadratic cones crossed with manifolds locally. Okay, so, so the types of singularities you get are like quadratic cone singularities. Um, but working at some more details is kind of work in progress. 
Okay, um, so now you say I have uh, this nice symplectic manifold and I just defined uh, another group action, which is Hamiltonian has a momentum map. So then you're uh, demanding that you would like to reduce by this symmetry. You would like to apply Marsden Weinstein and say, well, I can um, reduce this to a smaller symplectic manifold using this trick of, of taking a level set and quotient. Um, but of course, in the Marsden Weinstein theorem, um, there, there were kind of assumptions that the thing you get is actually a manifold. And we know that um, singularities can occur in these frame spaces. So we can't apply that directly. Um, luckily, there's a, a theorem of Shamar and Lehrman, which um, in great generality says that you actually don't care about the, the manifold conditions so much. Um, so, so the worst thing that happens if you have singularities is that the, the construction you would do, which is look at um, a level set of a coadjoint orbit, mod G, that you get a symplectic stratified space. Uh, and th this just means the thing you get is like not necessarily a manifold, but it's kind of a union of symplectic manifolds. Um, and if that, let's say that this is connected, uh, then even better, you have a unique open stratum, which is um, connected and dense. So the takeaway here, uh, the less technical takeaway is to say, okay, I can do the Marsden Weinstein reduction process. I end up, maybe the thing I don't, maybe the thing I get isn't a manifold, but like it's mostly a manifold. There's an open dense subset, which is a splitting manifold. And that, that's uh, kind of all I need if I want to do things like um, uh, measure theoretic computations, which we'll get to in a second. Okay, so from that, we see that, um, okay, I can run this reduction process uh, on the torus action, and I get this space, space of frames with prescribed norms and frame operator spectrum, mod G. Now G is this product group, unitary across the torus action. So unitary being ro rotate the frame vectors, T being uh, phase the frame vectors on the right. Um, and then this thing is a symplectic stratified space. And, and the takeaway is that there's a big open dense subset sitting in here that's a, a nice symplectic manifold. Okay, so now I wanna get to the, um, the last application for the talk, which is uh, to talk about how eigensteps come to the story and um, how you can say kind of some measure theoretic uh, things about frame spaces. All right, so um, given a frame and C to D times N, the kth partial frame operator is what I get if I take frame vector times frame vector um, transpose. Here I get a D by D matrix, and then I add those together up to K. It's the kth partial frame operator. All right, so then I can look at um, the jth eigenvalue of that thing, and it's sorted in decreasing order, um, and that's what's called the KJ eigenstep for F. Um, okay, so, so the, the set of eigensteps is, has like all this rich combinatorial structure. I'm not going to talk so much about this, but um, when n is 4, d equals 3, uh, you know that they, they get arranged in this kind of uh, what's called a gelfand sedlin pattern, um, where I have all these eigenvalues in this kind of triangle, and I have all these inequalities, and uh, it's, it's all very beautiful, and um, you can use uh, these inequalities or there's certain equalities associated to subspaces. Um, to prove things. And, and th this came into play in the, the original proof of the frame homotopy conjecture. All right, so now um, I, I claim that uh, the eigensteps themselves are momentum maps. That, that's where we're going here. So I need to define um, a torus action. And uh, the torus action is only defined for certain frames, uh, somewhat annoyingly. But let's consider the subset of frames whose kth partial frame operator um, has a uh, jth eigenvalue uh, or ha has isolated jth eigenvalue, okay? Um, let's, let, let's denote the associated eigenvector as, as UKJ. All right, so then I have a circle action defined on that subset, which does this. So theta, I, I'm thinking of as um, say a, uh, a number between zero and two pi or as a point in the circle. And I wanna act on a frame which has this isolated eigenvalue condition what do I do? I form this matrix A, where I take uh, UKJ times UKJ star, that's a Hermitian matrix, um, multiply by I, so I get a skew Hermitian matrix, and then uh, multiply the whole thing by theta, okay? Exp out, so I'm exping out a skew Hermitian matrix, so then that means that this thing is a unitary matrix overall. And I take the first K frame vectors and, and hit them with that unitary, and leave the rest fixed. 
Okay, um, not maybe totally obvious that this is a circle action, but you can show that um, the period of this, uh, as I go to two pi, that this becomes the identity again. Um, maybe think about it for a second. <clears throat> okay, so I have a circle action, and then uh, so that that was for the um, jth eigenvalue of the kth frame operator. So I really have like a whole pile of circle actions corresponding to different k's and j's. Um, and then it turns out that this collection of circle actions uh, gives a well-defined torus action on an open dense set of this thing, okay? So remember, like, really, I have an open dense set sitting here that is the symplectic manifold I care about because of the shamar uh, um theorem. And then I want to take a further open dense subset where all my eigensteps are isolated, basically. Uh, once I have that, then all, all these circle actions are well-defined. You can show that they um, uh, commute with each other. So that means that um, I get a torus action. And in fact, that action is Hamiltonian and the mo momentum map is the eigenstep map. Okay, so I take uh, my unitary or my, my G equivalence class of F and uh, I send that to this collection of eigensteps. And that's the, the momentum map for my torus action where I'm thinking of the dual of the Lie algebra to this torus as R to uh, whatever the dimension is. Okay, so uh, you can say more than this, in fact. Um, so if uh, gamma is strongly lambda admissible, so in the inequalities uh, that define admissibility, if they're all strict, then you say it's strongly admissible. Um, the image of this momentum map is a convex polytope uh, with this dimension. Okay, so some sort of complicated formula um, where you have to take into account multiplicities of uh, eigenvalues in your prescribed um, spectrum. But the, the point really is that this is half the dimension of this uh, of this space. Okay, where by dimension I mean dimension of the big open dense subset. Um, so that means that this is what's called a toric symplectic manifold, which is just a symplectic manifold with a half half dimensional Hamiltonian torus action. And that, that's like this really special circumstance where you get kind of like extra uh, special properties coming from that, that structure. Um, I'll mention that this generalizes uh, results of Flashkin Milson and Hagen and Pegel. Um, both were in the context of fun TF space. Okay, so, so let's uh, apply this uh, very special torx and manifold structure. So I say that a frame is full spark if I can pick any subset of D columns and they're linearly independent. Um, and then from the uh, same paper that, uh, that had the proof of the frame homotopy conjecture, um, Cahill, Mixon, and Strawn show that in the space of fun TFs, the set of full spark frames is open and dense. Um, this can be refined, once again, playing the same game. Uh, the same is true for more general frame spaces, and you can kind of prove it all at once using some punctic properties. Um, okay, so for any spectrum and vector of norms, I can look at this space of frames which once again, I'm, I'm prescribing my frame norms and the spectrum of my frame operator. Um, this thing's a compact subset of C to the D times N, so it admits a uniform probability measure. Uh, and then the, the result is that there are three possibilities given this data. Uh, one is that this frame space actually doesn't have anything in it, okay? Uh, one is that there's something in it, but they're all um, spark degenerate. There are no full spark frames in there. And the last possibility is that the set of full spark frames is full measure. So you could, you could have some spark degenerate things, but um, the, the full spark things are full measure. Uh, okay, so, so I'll just briefly sketch the proof here. Um, step one is very easy. So this is, uh, if gamma is not lambda admissible, then existing results of Kazatsa and Leon tell me that um, this is an empty set. Okay, fine. Uh, the second condition is if uh, gamma is lambda admissible, but not strongly, okay? So um, if, if gamma is lambda admissible, then this is not empty, but if I have uh, an equality in one of these that's supposed to be an inequality, then um, you can use the eigenstep conditions, like these various inequalities, uh, to show that any frame is spark deficient, in fact. And this is um, a fairly constructive proof. Uh, but I want to get to the, the more symplectic story here. So now assume that um, <clears throat> gamma is lambda, strongly lambda admissible, meaning that all of these inequalities here are strict. Um, so then I can look at the set of points in the eigenstep polytope, 
whose um, eigenstep lambda uh, dd is not zero, and that's a full measure thing um, you, you can show. Now, uh, what does that correspond to? That's saying take the dth partial frame operator and uh, show that it doesn't have any zero eigenvalues. Okay. Um, so what does that mean? That means that if I take the first D columns of my frame, that these are linearly independent. Now, here's where the, the symplectic story comes in. So th there's a theorem called the deuster heckman theorem, which tells me that um, if I have a toric symplectic manifold, then the, uh, the, the momentum map is measure preserving from the kind of natural symplectic measure on my manifold to a, a multiple of Lebesgue measure on the um, polytope. Uh, in, in the in the dual Lie algebra. Okay, so since I have a full measure thing in my eigenstep polytope, that tells me by the deuster heckman theorem that the um, space of frames whose first D columns are linearly independent is full measure in the frame space. Once you have that, it's uh, you just make some argument about permutation and variance and you're done. So you say, okay, this, this actually works for any choices of columns. So, so the real meat of this is throwing another big Symplectic theorem at it. Um, so once again, it, it follows easily from symplectic principles, but depending on um, you know how much you're willing to believe these these, uh, these big symplectic geometry theorems. Okay, so um, th there are future directions here. Um, I'll, I'll mention a couple, but not dwell on this too much. So uh, you know, in light of this Loisterman Heckman theorem, this suggests a way to sample frames um, in a in a principled way. So if I can uniformly sample the eigenstep polytope, and then um, kind of hit that with a group action, then I can prove that that is kind of giving me the correct measure measure on frame space. Um, so it'd be interesting to implement this and to use this to do hypothesis testing and experimentation on distributions of eigenvalues or other frame theoretic properties. Um, so we, we have this probabilistic guarantee that uh, full spark things are probability one in frame spaces, and you would like to try to generalize this to more, uh, to kind of richer um, properties, like for example, RIP um, for frames in these more complicated frame spaces, or it'd be interesting to generalize uh, these results to other spaces of frames um, or generalize frames like fusion frames. Um, okay, so I should, uh, Thank NSF for, for funding this research um, and uh, give you some references. So our uh, first paper on this was recently published in Advances in Computational Math. Um, so this is covering the frame homotopy stuff. Uh, we have another paper which should be on the archive um, soon, hopefully the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, so, so keep an eye peeled for that. Uh, but then I will end there and, and, and say thanks for listening. All right, thanks, Tom. Everybody hit that reaction button. Yeah. And if there, uh, I think Dustin can stop the recording.